Thank you, Ashley. I, I thought I might try with, without this just briefly. Can I turn this off? Um, it's over there. Well, and see whether you can hear me without it, because people usually can. <laughs> You want to try turning it off and see, or I'll just stand back from it. And uh, oh, that's for the tape. This is for the tape, is it not? Okay, fine. Well, we'll go ahead with it. <laughs> Sorry. I, I knew that. I was going to give a talk on contagion in Islamic thought, but now I'm going to drop that. <laughs> and I just want to thank uh, everybody for coming. Ashley has shown me around the campus. It's very, very beautiful. It's my first time to this campus, and I had lunch with a few of the students, and I was very impressed with their spirit of engagement. And I think that when it comes to China, that's really important. And part of what I'll talk about is why I think that is important. I thought I would take kind of a running uh, approach to my topic by going back to what I thought many of us thought in 1989 when the Tiananmen June 4th incident took place. As you know, the students came out in Beijing uh, to uh, demand an end to corruption and a resumption of reform, and many of them demanded something that they called democracy, although they had various things in mind by that, and not only in Beijing, but in over 300 other cities, and not only students, but many other urban residents. And as we showed in the Tiananmen papers that came out in 2001, so quite a few years after the event itself, uh, that was a book that uh, contained secret intra-party and intra-government documents that the party and government circulated among themselves at the time of the crisis. The regime uh, became divided and uh, might have collapsed and found its way out of that crisis by the retired senior leaders and especially Deng Xiaoping deciding to use force to stop the movement and shoot some of the people in Beijing. After that event, most of us China specialists held the view that the regime was bankrupt that nobody believed in communism, nobody believed in the Chinese Communist Party, the people were not loyal, the regime's economic reform had gotten into a dead end so that inflation and corruption were very bad and that although they had saved themselves for a short time with the use of force, the use of force itself was going to just spell the end of the regime and that was followed by the collapse of the Eastern European and Soviet communist regimes. The East Germans, as you may remember, got on a train and many East Germans went to Hungary and the regime tried to stop that and uh, East Germans heard a rumor that you could cross the Berlin Wall and the, the guards at the Berlin Wall were waiting for orders about what to do and the Politburo couldn't give any orders and the East German regime fell and then the other regimes fell. So it seemed as though the wave Chinese often believed that it was due to their courage in Tiananmen that communism had fallen in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, that they had sparked it. I don't know if that's true, but many of us thought the wave would come back to hit China, but it didn't. Instead, the use of force intimidated opposition in China. Deng Xiaoping kind of last gasp um, did his famous trip to the south and said we must resume economic reform. They resumed economic reform. They went for WTO membership and joined it. The economy, they got inflation under control. The economic growth kicked in and has been growing at 8 to 10 percent a year. And then the next piece of my autobiography that I want to tell you about to contextualize my topic today is the work that I did on the book that Ashley mentioned called China's New Rulers. And what happened there was that a, uh, you know, in the case of the Tiananmen papers, I was approached by somebody from within the regime who said, we want to get these documents out. 
and people have asked me, how did you get the papers? And I say, I'll never tell, you know, even if you torture me by showing me even more of the Middlebury campus that in the swimming pool that I can't swim in, I'm still not going to tell you. <laughs> so, but then uh, I was approached by an official who, you know, once you start to be approached and start to put out you know, things, and I've decided never to do it again because it's very time consuming, but I was approached again by somebody who said that we want to get out the story of the new leaders coming in, that is to say what's now the current leadership, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, who succeeded to, I think everybody here knows Jiang Zemin. Does everybody know that? Because I'd be happy to provide more, more or less background according to what you would like. Uh, this was before the Hu Jintao succession, and this person said, we have materials, bios, that the Communist Party has put together on the new leaders and their policy positions and their careers and so on. So Bruce and I processed that material into a book called China's New Rulers. What impressed me a lot about the material that I was uh, reviewing for China's New Rulers was the orderliness of the succession. Here was a regime that it had so many power struggles. Um, a new, a very interesting new book is just coming out by McFarquhar and Michael Schernels called Mao's Last Revolution about the Cultural Revolution. The power struggles, Mao purging Liu Xiaoqi, Mao purging Lin Biao, Mao dying his uh, widow and her colleagues being arrested, Hua Guofeng, his designated successor, being eased out of power, Deng Xiaoping coming out, Deng purging his followers, Zhao Zi, uh, first Hu Yaobang, whose death was the occasion for 1989, then purging Zhao Ziyang in the course of 1989, the elders picking Jiang Zemin up from Shanghai and sending him really against party procedure into the the leadership, Jiang having a very hard time consolidating power, having to then purge his rivals like Chao Shu and finally have, you know, a, a history of struggle that you could take all the way back to the founding of the party in 1921. And here in the succession in 2002, three, um, it was, uh, it was so smooth. Hu Jintao, the guy who succeeded to supreme power, had actually been chosen not by Jiang. I mean, that's one of the unusual things, is the outgoing guy didn't choose his own successor, but had been chosen before Jiang by Deng Xiaoping. Not before Jiang, but be, before Deng passed away, Deng chose this young man and said, we'll put him into the position of the heir apparent, 1992. And who was not only chosen by somebody other than Zhang, but stayed in that position of heir apparent for the whole 10 years without getting purged. Zhang finished out his term in office without getting purged. Many leaders in China didn't finish their term of office. He stepped down at the end of his term of office. Now there's a little wrinkle there because it took Zhang an extra year to step out of his third position as the head of the Central Military Commission, but he did do so. And, and um, the uh, military did not intervene. The elders who were surviving, elders Dung was dead, but the other elders who were out of power uh, didn't intervene. And the whole thing went off kind of like clockwork. And not only did Hu Jintao succeed to power in this smooth way, but if you looked at the entire Politburo Standing Committee, which is the top power body in the party and hence in the whole country and at the whole Politburo itself, which is the next level of power. What we discovered in working on this book, China's New Rulers, is that all of those people had actually been brought up by a very lengthy, deliberate process within the party personnel system that started back in the early 1980s when Deng Xiaoping gave an order. So the early 1980s is the early post-Mao period, early post-Cultural Revolution period, and Deng in 1982 was looking back over the history of Mao and the Cultural Revolution and saying, that was a mess. What we need to do now, 1982, is to start to pick young leaders 
that will come up slowly and learn the ropes, be trained. It's like the tenure system in a university, or, or it's like IBM or some huge bureaucracy. Um, so they, he said, we want people with four characteristics, the si hua. They should be young. They should be educated. They should be revolutionary. And I forget the third one right now, specialized or something like that. So in Chinese Communist Party, when the top guy puts out an order like that, everybody jumps. So in every province, in every ministry, the head guy would be like, who do I have who's got these attributes that I want to promote? And they all picked people and created a list. And as I have, I think we said in the book that if, if, if the CIA had had, a li had that list, which had, I think, 300 names on it in 1982, they would have known the, uh, you know, who was going to come up in power. They would have had the names of every single member of the 2002 Politburo, as well as a number of other names of people who didn't go that far of course, but who went very far up. Now think about in the United States. If the Chinese security could get a list of 300 names today in 2006, do you think any of those people would be president or cabinet secretaries or something like that in 2026? I don't think so. Some governor from some damn southern state or some you know, half qualified individual, not to use any harsher language, will probably be the president of the United States. So. This is what I would call a very orderly system of personnel advancement. Now, that kind of a system can create bad results. But in fact, in China, I wouldn't say that it has created bad results from the optic of the regime, from my position as a human rights activist or democracy advocate. The results are not that favorable because these are not people who are interested in human rights and democracy. When Ashley asked me how I should be introduced there was a piece of information I didn't suggest, which maybe is relevant now, which is that I'm the chair of the board of a group called Human Rights in China. And particularly because I'm going to argue today that the Chinese authoritarian system is resilient, I want you to understand that this is not my value position. My value position is the opposite. This is my analytic position like the CIA national intelligence estimate that was recently leaked. We assess that, and I love that language. Islamic fundamental, you know, radicalism is increasing. That's their assessment. That's not what the CIA advocates. And I, although I'm not the CIA, I would like that same distinction to be, to be clear to you. Um, so I was quite impressed with the internal stability of the regime, its ability to handle a succession and to promote a cadre of you know, competent people who have, if you look at all the biographies, served in a lot of different posts. Hu Jintao served in a variety of posts in the provinces and in, in Gansu, Tibet, and so forth, and then uh, and Guizhou, and served in the Chinese Youth League, and Wen Jiabao served in the Central Party apparatus and served as a vice premier running parts of the economy. So these are people with a lot of experience who have, who appeared to us in, when we wrote the book and who I think in retrospect have been competent policy makers. They are able to collect information from the society, understand what the problems are, problems in the banking system, problems in the rural uh, economic system with pe what are called peasant burdens, the peasants being taxed and paying too many fees, problems with um, the rise of the internet as a, a problem that they have to address, problems in their foreign policy with Taiwan or with Japan. They're able to get good information. They're able to sit down and talk about it with experts whom they've got around them in think tanks. They're able to deliberate. They're able to come to an agreement. They do a great deal of in-house talk. They're able to divide up the responsibility so that the guy who runs the economy runs it. That's one Jia Bao. And the guy who runs Taiwan affairs, which is ultimately Hu Jintao, makes those decisions and so forth. And they don't interfere with one another's business. The guy who runs security, who does a very good job of it, is Lo Gan, and he runs it. And they're able to make decisions that a lot of times pan out. Now, I don't want to point to them as super 
heroes, and they do make mistakes. They have also a lot of trouble implementing their policies down to the uh, to the uh, you know grassroots. Oftentimes, it's a huge struggle. So you want to stop, for example, construction that's done by provincial leaders that's over in, inefficient overinvestment. The central government has a long, hard road to make that happen, but they, they keep on it. And if you think back to the whole history of the reforms, um, the abolition of the commune system, the introduction of a private housing market, the uh, construction of an environmental protection system, bureaucracy and laws, which is by far not yet you know, doing the full job that it has to do, but huge changes have happened. And so th at this point, what we see is the capability to continue to make change that is deemed to be supporting the continuation of the regime. So I was impressed with this uh, capability of the regime to handle a succession and handle elite rotation and replacement and to, and to, and to promote technocrats. So now that was O2. So now we have uh, a debate happening. This brings me kind of up to date. Um, and this is a debate that happens off and on with Americans looking at China, right? It's like in 1950, you know, <laughs> what would the communists do? And then starting in the 60s, we were always talking about after Mao, who we were right, but we didn't know it. <laughs> uh, right? Okay, bad joke. <laughs> uh, for so many years we talked about what would happen after Mao, and the answer was more Mao, but he finally died. And uh, so this debate about, and then when Deng came into power and started the reforms, and in 1978, Deng Xiaoping visited the United States. I'm sure all of you remember that very clearly, right? No, you're not born yet. And, and went to Houston and wore a cowboy hat and cowboy boots and everything, and he was on the cover of Time magazine. We were then debating, was China going to democratize or not? Really, how fast would it democratize? Deng didn't care about communism. He was black cat, white cat. China was going to democratize. He was just tricking the old guard by talking about the four upholds, you know, that we have to uphold the principle of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, and so forth, and he didn't really care. That turned out to be wrong. Then, as I said, in 89, we all figured that the regime was going to collapse, and it didn't collapse. So it's a cyclical debate. And right now, the debate is being triggered, I think, by two things. One is that uh, when Hu Jintao came to power, many people, because of his necktie and his suit and his haircut and all that thing, and many people thought, and, and because of WTO membership and things, people thought, that now we're going to see a reform leadership. And Bruce Gilley and I in our book said that that's not true, but that, he, that Hu Jintao and his other uh, colleagues were not interested in moving the uh, political system in a liberal or democratic direction. But many people expected it. And then the other thing that's, and that hasn't happened. And on the contrary, we see a crackdown. We see the human rights and democracy situation getting worse. And Ashley has paid a lot of attention to the to the uh, internet journalists and foreign journalists and Chinese journalists who've been detained and arrested and beaten and various things like that that have happened to them. And then in human rights in China, we look across a broad span, religious freedom is being curtailed and uh, the so-called uh, Weichan or rights defense or civil rights movement in China, there's been a, a rolling crackdown on that. So with the retrogression of of uh, human rights under WHO, which has its causes. I probably don't have time to go into that, but I could in Q&A, but you know, having to do with the next party Congress and various events that are happening. Um, the debate is triggered, you know, which direction is China going in? And the other thing that I think is powering that revival of that debate is the intensification of US relations with China as we have a bigger and bigger trade deficit as we seem to be unable to exert influence over their uh, exchange rate regime, which has 
achieved a kind of talismanic significance in Washington out of all proportion to the real significance of the exchange rate. And as we depend more and more on China to handle the North Korea problem and the Iran problem and so on, uh, it, it just people in China want to know, you know, what is happening with China, people in Washington, I mean, and, and China's answer has been to bring out this theory called peaceful rise. And then that has elicited a lot of two, two debates. Is there a China threat or not? and will China democratize or not. So that's the context in which quite a few books have been recently published and the Carnegie Endowment, as Ashley said, has invited McFarquhar and me to go to Washington on Thursday of this week and have a so-called debate. Old guys like us don't really debate. Too polite, you know, but uh, whatever, we'll see. If he contradicts me, I'll definitely, <laughs> you know. Anyway, they call it a debate. Now, in this position, everybody has their own nuanced position, but there are really three big theories out there in the American body politic about how China's going to move. And one is the theory of collapse. There is a book published, I think, in 2001 by a guy named Gordon Chang, an American lawyer who had been working in Shanghai, now lives in around the New York area called the coming collapse of China. And Gordon's argument was that, you know, the peasants are, uh, you know, rising up and the laid off workers are dissatisfied. And you see so many protests. Recently, the Chinese Ministry of Public Security issued a statistic saying that collective protests are up. And there were 84,000 of them in the year 2005, which is a very hard statistic to analyze. What you know? What, what, what's the definition, and what, how, why do they? Why are they issuing that statistic? But it does has achieved this circulation in the debate that wow, there's 84,000 mass incidents, and it's an increase of whatever it was over the year before. Gordon was pointing to that kind of thing. Many people have lost faith in the regime. There's the rise of all kinds of religions, Christianity, Falun Gong, which the regime has suppressed within China, but the fact that it got as big as it got. The banking system, according to some economic analysts, is what they call technically bankrupt, which is a, a, a tricky thing to understand, and I'm not a banker, but basically what they're saying is that the Chinese banks have a lot of non-performing loans to the point where if they were in a market system, they would be bankrupt. But the thing is, they're not in a market system so that they still exist. And it is a little hard. I mean, you can't um, just jump ahead and say that they can't function because they wouldn't if they were in a market system, because the Chinese government has huge financial power and is quite insulated from the global financial regime since their currency is not convertible, in fact, and they have a large foreign exchange, I guess the biggest in the world, uh, reserve. So Gordon looks at uh, social issues and cultural issues and the psychology of the Chinese people and the state of the economy and so on and says that this is not sustainable and the system is going to collapse. Now, we might be interested in knowing how he thinks it would collapse or what it really means for the Chinese system to collapse. Because one good thing about studying being a China specialist is that China will always be there. I guess, uh, whether it collapses or not, it's still going to be there, and we can continue to teach our classes, draw our salaries. But so Gordon doesn't say a whole lot about how it's going to collapse. Neither does Rod McFarquhar, who, who believes that the system is somehow bankrupt and will collapse. And there's another book by Pei Min Shin, Pei Min Shin, P-E-I-M-I-N-X-I-N, called The China's Trapped Transition, which is sort of like a China collapse theory, although he focuses more on the current state of affairs. Well, so, so does everybody. I mean, all of us are essentially discussing things about the current state of affairs and how we see the trajectories that lead out of those. But Pei spends most of his pages talking about the corruption and the lack of governance, the lack of control over environmental issues, failure to deliver public health. Uh, benefits and education, goods to the population, and uh, 
says that the transition is trapped, so what's going to happen next? But he says a number of things about that. You have to read his book to, re to get all the uh, details of how he sees the possible outcomes. But in general, I would classify him as saying that the system is not sustainable and that it's, it would be a, a, unlikely to have a you know, peaceful transition to something else. So more or less kind of a collapse theory. Then there's a body of theory that says China will democratize. So they, Bruce Gilley, my co-author with the China's New Ruler books, is an uh, upfront um, advocate of this point of view with his book called How China Will Democratize, which came out a couple of years ago. Um, and another place where you can look for that theory as well as to the speeches of our presidents, you know, whether it's Bush the first or Clinton or Bush the second or, you know, many other policymakers base their policy on this view that China will democratize if we just keep engaging with China. This is the, t so the argument here, one of the arguments is it's the tide of history. That was Bill Clinton when he went to Beijing and gave a speech at Beida said that, you know, you're, your government is swimming against the tide of history because democracy is everywhere and it's everybody wants it and your people want it. I'll come a little bit later to some of the social science theories about why that might be the tide of history. But Gilly says, yeah, all of the things that you mentioned that you collapse people mentioned are wrong with China, the peasants and the laid off workers and the pollution and the financial system. And, the religions, but he says the leadership knows that and the Communist Party leadership has reformers within it who will see that as in so many other countries in history that faced unmanageable problems when they were under a dictatorship that the way to solve all of those issues is to move toward a democratic system that ventilates issues and allows uh, society to uh, send signals to the regime about what needs to be done and allows uh, you know, the system to function better. And Gilly believes that there is a pro-democracy faction in the leadership and that it will link up with pro-democracy forces in the society at some moment of crisis and that crises will occur and then you'll have a move toward democracy. And he tells a lot about how that would happen. And the third position in the debate is a position that I've articulated in a, in a number of writings, which I call resilient authoritarianism. Hence, you know, the top title of this lecture on the posters around the campus. And I start with the top-down view that I mentioned coming out of the book China's New Rulers, that the, the leaders themselves are intent on power, that the party itself is... Uh, is a well-functioning machine. And then I, I address the bottom-up concerns that most of these other authors emphasize, the state-society relationship. So I say, yeah, you have all those problems. So all of us agree that these problems are there about the peasants, the environment, and the financial system. But I say that the regime, proceeding from it's the most important thing is the will to power. And I argue that authoritarian regimes are not overthrown until the time when they give up. The, now, why do they give up? Why did the East German regime give up is a very interesting question, or the Soviet regime. Uh, but, and the collapse guys could come back to me and say, the leaders give up simply because the society refuses to accept them and they see that. That's why Ceausescu fled, right? When he was booed in the square, he fled because he knew he was going to be killed. So, okay, I could enter into that argument. I don't want to enter into it now, but what I, what I just want to, I guess, assert is that I, I make the claim that the, as long as the regime hangs together and is intent on keeping power, nobody can overthrow them. And then I say that they see all the same problems that we see and they do things about it. I've already talked about policy innovation as one of the big things that they do. So when the peasants are, you know, a, a sea of seething sea of discontent, 
the leadership has done several very important things. They've uh, held village elections, which has been efficacious. I think the evidence, show, although the elections are fake, I'm the first to agree to that or, or assert it. Nonetheless, it, it provides a way to get rid of local leaders that are unacceptable to the peasants and has served that function. They have allowed the peasants to migrate to the cities for work. They have lifted hundreds of millions of peasants out of poverty defined by whatever measure you want, the Chinese or the World Bank poverty line through a lot of different methods. And then most recently, they've announced the abolition of the rural taxes and fees. Now, there's a big debate over whether those taxes and fees have truly been abolished and so forth. And the answer probably is in a huge country like China that it varies from place to place. But in some places, they have been abolished. And in any case, that's been announced. So, um, so, so the regime holds on to power. I want to give a number of reasons. First, by the will to power and hanging together as a regime. Secondly, by policy innovation. Thirdly, by uh, successful control over public opinion through a very complicated process of controlling the media and controlling the internet. Now, of course, control over the media and the internet is not perfect, and Ashley was telling me there are 34 million blogs. And it's a, it's a moving game, but I would say that as of today, October 2nd, 2006, you may have 34 million blogs, but the regime has enough internet police to run around and shut down the blogs that get too much attention or that say something that's too radical. The other ones can exist. That's not going to overthrow the regime. And it's the same thing with media control. Meantime, they're out there very positively projecting their media message, which is a message about we got the Olympics, we told the Japanese to go to hell, we've bottled up Chen Shui-bian, the president of Taiwan, we told the Americans that they can't push us around, we're solving the, uh, you know, we love HIV AIDS patients and we're giving them free drugs and we, we actually went and kissed them. Um, they send out all, we're, we're cracking down on corruption. So the Chinese regime doesn't just sit there waiting for the internet and the mass media to shape their image. They have a lot of people that they hire and pay who are party members to go out there and create an image. And they've created a very diverse press. You, those of you who've read the Chinese press, there's sports newspapers and fashion pages and everything else. So that most Chinese, uh, you know, Ashley's good buddies with the head of the Shanghai Media Group and other media groups, most Chinese who live in the media environment feel that they have access to everything that they want in the media. It's a lot of diversity. It's only the ones with a very sharp, you know, sense of political curiosity that would feel somewhat frustrated and that's going to be, can always turn into an important group, but most of the time it's not. Uh, so, regime sticks together, policy innovation, control of public opinion through propaganda, uh, growth of the economy, so that many, many people and especially urban residents feel that my life is better now than it was five years ago and it will be better five years from now than it is now. These are very important attitudes in public opinion. So if we see migrant workers who are poverty stricken and HIV AIDS sufferers who are locked up in villages and so forth, those people are here, there, and there. While the big urban mass, and I think that any toppling of the Chinese regime has to be done in the cities now, because it can't be done in the countryside because the countryside is too dispersed and the military will, you know, has the easiest possible time, the people's armed police and cracking down on isolated rural incidents, the urban residents by and large are in, living in an environment of tremendous prosperity and construction and more and more entertainment and cons consumer opportunities. Then another element of the picture is a successful foreign policy that people are proud of. And another element of the picture is repression. So it's important to include in our understanding of how the regime survives its skillful and determined use of repression. It arrests, you know, Falun Gong pops up, they've 
basically wiped it out in China, as far as I can tell. China Democracy Party is formed. They watch for a little while, arrest everybody, send exile some of the leaders to the United <laughs> States. Uh, all these arrests. Now, one of the interesting things is some of the most recent outrages that have taken place, like this blind activist. Well, the Zhao Yan case, the New York Times researcher who was arrested for leaking state secrets. They couldn't convict him. They had nothing on him. So they uh, held him ag against their own procedural law for a number of, uh, for a long, long time, many months. And then the more the New York Times protested, the more that the Chinese said, OK, I'm going to convict him for you know, littering or for just whatever. And that's what they did. They sentenced him to four years for some ridiculous thing. And this blind activist is sort of my favorite case, quote unquote. It's very tragic. I met this guy when he's visiting New York, sweetest, nicest young man. Um, just you know, very inspiring person who was blind from early in life with a fever that he had contracted and sent the usual road of blind people in China to study massage and Chinese medicine and back to the village and working with villagers and other disadvantaged people and found out that the women were being subjected to forced abortions and forced sterilizations. And he, you know, he was very empathetic and he began to study the law and tell these women how they could appeal and all this kind of thing. And the local party secretary who wanted those birth planning, birth targets to be under the target so he could get ahead in his career, at first was proud of, you know, look, we have rule of law and for freedom here in our, in Linny, Linny, Lin Shi, Linny Shen, or Linny, whatever it is in Shandong. And then when uh, Mr. Chun began to get a lot of international press and began to tell too many women how to, you know, that their rights were being violated, the local party secretary got irritated, had him beat up, and so on and so forth. And then he kept on going, and he was more and more prominent internationally, so they railroaded him on some, again, ludicrous charge. To, my question is, why, when, the cent, when local... Uh, authorities or the security apparatus do things that are so embarrassing to China it, and it becomes an international incident and the top leaders have to deal with it. Why do the top leaders decide to support the local guy and go ahead and allow these convictions to take place? Because as you know, the courts in China are not at all independent on any sensitive case. And I believe the answer is that these cases send a useful signal domestically and internationally exactly to the New York Times, above all, that you, you, know, you don't mess with us and we're not afraid of you in the least. Exactly to the, you know, so that these cases come along and provide an opportunity for the regime to send a signal to domestic activists and international forces that we are strong. And then the local guy that did the thing will not be promoted, but that's very quiet. So this is my view of why the regime is resilient today. Now, I want to emphasize something political scientists like to emphasize, which is contingency, which is my little back door where I say, that's the way I see it today. But we may walk out of here and get a news flash that you know, everything changed. And then I'm going to tell you, that ah, I predicted that also, right? Remember, I talked about contingency. But you have to. Let's be honest. China is a moving target. It is a fragile uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for here? You know, system the system thing, you know, uh, not homeostasis. It, it is a, it's, a, it's an evolving system. It's change within stability. But if you think back to how I've described it, this is a system that's held together with much effort. It is not a system that just hangs together very beautifully like Middlebury College or something that's you know, a U functional system, EU functional system. It is a system that's held together with a lot of coercion, with a lot of, you know, putting out fires all around the place. There's a vast pace of social change taking place. And we have to acknowledge 
the potential fragility of the system. So the debate, all of a sudden, I converge with my debating you know, opponents in a certain sense in saying the system is fragile and could be upset at any time by exogenous events. My difference with them is over endogenous and exogenous events. I do not see the endogenous internal dynamics that are causing that system to inevitably collapse or democratize. What I do acknowledge is that if there was a war in the Taiwan Strait, if there was another SARS epidemic, if there were a downturn in the U.S. economy that would cause a decline in Chinese exports, uh, the regime could be fragile to something that a political scientist years and years and years ago, Chalmers Johnson, called power deflation. I like that term because it's so mystical that you, you know. But power deflation is the idea that certain kinds of power that are based with a lot of coercion can easily disappear, whereas normative power doesn't disappear so much. So we had like Watergate or we have like today, I would say, a policy disaster in Washington with with a popularity rating of whatever it is, 37% or something. And our system doesn't deflate because it's not really based on coercion. But if you had a similar series of events in China, if China invaded, <laughs> I don't know where, because Taiwan, let's say, for example, and couldn't maintain control over Taiwan, and, and the news got into China, which is another big if, Power deflation. So you get the idea. Now I want to. I do want to uh, begin to wrap up so that we'll have a chance for Q and A and comments and contradictions, and you guys can tell me what's wrong with my argument. So when I go down on Thursday, I'll be armed with your advice. But before I do uh, wrap up, I want to talk about three theories that under uh, tend to undergird the arguments that the regime is not sustainable that have to do with globalization. That was the uh, other piece of my lecture title today. You know, how is globalization affecting China? Because it clearly is deeply engaged in globalization. And um, isn't it enough to, s wouldn't, wouldn't, isn't my point of view about resilient authoritarianism sufficiently contradicted simply by saying this is a country that's deeply engaged in globalization? Doesn't globalization really spell the unsustainability of a regime of this kind? Well, there are three, my answer is no, of course, and there are three theories uh, about why uh, that, that I say do not necessarily apply to China because China is different in some way from the assumptions of these theories. So the first theory is this theory that says that a rising middle class demands democratization. There are so many theorists, right? Seymour Martin Lipset and recently not Jaworski and Lemangi, but the criticism of Jaworski and Lemangi by um, Wash and Stokes and world politics. So, you know, there's been a, this is another debate. I'm talking about my debate and here's this other debate. But there's been this very, very strong argument in the sociology and poli-sci literature that says that modernization or globalization, because the globalization debate inherits a lot from a debate we used to call modernization. Um, same theories. Modernization brings the rise of a middle class. A middle class is a class that moves to the cities, has education, has property. A middle class will demand participation. A middle class will not be willing to live under a democratic regime because they have property to protect. They are cognitively mobilized, if you will. They know things about politics and have opinions, and they feel empowered because they're educated and have property. So they're going to demand democracy. Why might that theory not apply to China? Well, let me find out. No, I just want to check my, my, other, my longer form lecture notes. There are three conditions in China that um, that I think make this theory not work for China. 
One is that the middle class is very, very large in China, but there is a much larger set of classes underneath the middle class, the peasants and the migrant workers, that the middle class feels threatened by in China, as it so happens. In the cities where the middle class lives, they see a lot of migrant workers and hire a lot of migrant workers who come from the countryside, and they are afraid that in a democratic system, their interests will be overwhelmed by those of these underclasses of whom they're afraid of. Secondly, the Chinese middle class, this is a huge generalization, you know, with many examples pro and con, but I'll put it out here as a generalization, generally has prospered in alliance with the Chinese Communist Party by being co-opted. So if you go down to the individual level of the factory owner and the entrepreneur, or the, the guy who you know has done well in the countryside by raising rabbits, I didn't ask about the rabbit king, but I, I, I would bet that this is the case. This person um, is going to prosper by being favored by the local party secretary, by having that connection. You mentioned, who, who's, are you the rabbit, who's the rabbit king person? You mentioned that, you know, he, he was known for his good deeds, and that's a signal to me that he's buying credit with the party apparatus in the region. I, I don't doubt that. He's a, a lovely person and perfectly sincere, but it works like that. Give schools, give roads. That's a small, I'm just guessing, I don't know the guy, but small example, but you know, in general, so the middle class gets ahead by being co-opted by the Chinese Communist Party. And thirdly, the Chinese middle class, I think, pretty much understands democracy and human rights as a, 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 a strategy by hostile powers, the United States especially, to weaken China when at that magic moment when China is finally realizing its historical mission. So for all of those reasons, this particular middle class, at least now it seems to me, is not out there fighting for democracy. It's pretty happy with the current regime from which it benefits. Um, you might say, well, but Taiwan, South Korea, those prove that the theory is right, and the same thing will have to happen in China. But Taiwan and South Korea are so different from China, and one of the most important differences is that Taiwan and South Korea were dependent upon the United States strategically, and China is not. And there was a lot of American pressure that went into the democratic transitions in those two places. The second theory that I disagree with is a theory that says that under conditions of modernization or globalization that a, the society becomes and the market become too complicated for an authoritarian regime to manage. Tom Friedman, in his several books and in his columns, the op-ed columnist of the New York Times who talks about globalization has this golden arches theory of, of globalization saying that, you know, uh, the fi global financial markets will punish you and your economy will not succeed if you don't allow free flow of information and allow everybody to coordinate freely and you have to have democracy. Prior to Tom Friedman, there were many other theorists and most prominently somebody named Talcott Parsons, a famous sociologist in the 1950s who correctly predicted that totalitarian regimes like the Soviet if you read Talcott Parsons' book, The Social System, toward the end of the book, he has a section on why the Soviet system will ultimately fall. That book was published in 53 or 4, and he was absolutely right. Not only was he right in the prediction, but he was correct in the mechanisms that he described, you know, how it would happen and why the Soviet system couldn't coordinate such a complex society. But the, what the Chinese have done is to move into a you know, hybrid arrangement in which uh, the party re retains uh, political um, dominance, in which the uh, party and state m control the banking system, the railways, the uh, pillar industries, and a lot of the rest of the system regulates itself. 
and they control some information but not all information. And they've got this system working right now so that it defeats the theory. And um, I think one of the permissive conditions for that is, the, is exactly globalization, China's access to American and European markets for its products and the ability of China to float its economy along even if the state enterprises that remain are highly inefficient, that the G GNP keeps going up and people keep being employed and living standards go up because you're exporting to the United States um, with the cheap labor um, advantage. And the non-convertibility of the currency is another, I think, a condition that insulates China from this logic. The third theory that's out there about globalization is a theory of norm diffusion or soft power or what's called by some people sociological institutionalism. And that's a theory that says that in the global system, no, uh, no, no country can uh, isolate itself from, from the normative diffusion of the ideas of human rights and democracy, which at the bottom line of this theory is to say that these ideas are incredibly attractive or even correct, like Francis Fukuyama's view is quite frankly that the idea of democracy, the market, and human rights is simply correct and that it's the end of history. So if you have an open marketplace of ideas, the, those norms will diffuse. And then there's some other poli side people who are not willing to be quite as upfront as Francis Fukuyama, like say Catherine Sickink and Thomas Rissa, who don't say that thing is correct, but that leaves the question of why. But they say the norm diffuses of human rights through mechanisms of cross, you know, national communication and pressure and so on. Um, Engagement theory is another version of this where you say you engage the Chinese in various international regimes. They sign you know, the Environmental Protocol, Montreal Protocol, or they sign the Human Rights, say the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or the Convention on the Rights of the Child, or they sign a non weapons non-proliferation thing, and then they learn through involvement in that regime that the regime is good, that it's right, maybe that it benefits their national interest or in any case that they need to comply with it because any civilized country will. So the norms diffuse through the operation and that theory of the international system itself. Why is this not true? And I think the reason why this doesn't work is funded, well partly is that the regime continues to control Propaganda. I don't say ideology because I agree that the ideology is dead, but the regime controls propaganda and it's persuaded a lot of people that these Western ideas are not necessarily correct and that the West has ulterior motives that are trying to damage China. But the deepest reason why I think that theory hasn't worked so far is that China is China. China is the central kingdom. China sees itself as a civilization with a long history. If China's gonna be modern, it wants to have a modernity that is distinctively Chinese. The Chinese are, seems to me, fundamentally not interested in learning from somebody else all the details of how to be a modern civilized power. They want to work out their own, what one author called alternative modernity, another one of those lovely terms that I like to use on the campuses since we all know what that means. But I wouldn't dare use a term like that in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, if I had more time to filibuster, I would want to address the question of why it matters to us. But I think, um, you know, I, I won't. But I think that it is important for Americans to figure out and have a good understanding of China's trajectory. And in my opinion, important for us to get used to the fact that this regime is not collapsing and we probably will have to work with it for quite a long time, which sets a bit of a different framework around how you talk about China policy than I think is the usual framework within which it's discussed in Washington. And um, it, it puts a lot of importance in my view on the human rights agenda, you know, which is my little pitch, right? As uh, I think that that if 
China's not going to just democratize by virtue of Kentucky Fried Chicken being in Shanghai, then we do have to worry about the human rights agenda. And that raises a whole another lecture that Ashley would have to invite me back for if you want to hear what I think about how you do human rights with China and why it might be possible and how difficult it is. But that's another series of topics. Okay, let me get some Q&A. Do you want to recognize people and control the surging masses? <laughs> Thank you. Sure, I, um, I, I guess I'll stand as a buffer between the surging masses, these, those unruly <laughs> comments, and you, Andy. Not right. that I don't think you can take them, nor do I think they'll actually occur. Um, but yes, questions for Andy uh, about his arguments. Uh, any challenges uh, from the audience would, I think, be welcomed, mm -hmm. uh, seeing as he's, he's going up against some stiff competition on Thursday. Uh, Harvard's <laughs> best, Roderick McFarquhar. Yes, in the back. <laughs> Right. Yeah. My take obviously has to be very provisional right now because the whole story hasn't come out. And it would go against my whole argument if this ter breaks out into a factional struggle and shows that Hu Jintao is weak. And if others, uh, you know, people, uh, if there's any sign of division in the leadership or weakness, then it could lead to the power deflation I was talking about. But my, right now, my take on it is, of course, they, they do carry out a fight on corruption. I, think I wouldn't discount that part of it. And it may be that going this high will actually, in fact, do something to check the spread of corruption, so to speak. But but I think a lot of it is, as you said, cleaning out the Shanghai gang, getting control over the, over this city that has probably been, um, you know, run very independently of central government uh, economic controls and <coughs> controls on investment. And uh, in the lead up to the 17th Party Congress, the Party Congress that Bruce and I wrote about in the book took place in 2002, the 16th. They happen every five years. So the next one is 2007 in the fall, about a year from now. And at that time, the most senior members of the Politburo Standing Committee will step down. Right now, I forget how many, but quite a few of the nine of them, four or five of them will step down. And new people will be appointed who will include among them the one or more than one candidates to succeed Hu Jintao in the next five-year thing in 2012. So this is a very important Congress. And one can imagine, and they will be having this fall, this month, an important party plenum that will be part of the groundwork for the thing that's going to happen a year from now. So there is a lot of positioning going on about who's going to be promoted, who's going to be retiring. And I think that these events, which are murky, and I don't know the exact connection, are related to that jockeying for position. And I think that who has waited a long time and I believe is moving from a advantageous power position right now to do this and that he will be successful in putting his own people in charge in Shanghai. But if it doesn't work out like that, then, you know, my guess will be wrong. Sure. Um, Mark Williams and then Don Wyatt. Thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering, I know China is more or less a world in itself, and, and I learned a lot from what you were saying about um, course of Chinese development, where I can get it. But I'm wondering whether or not the, the explanation that you have, this concept of resilient authoritarianism, do you see it as being applicable beyond China? Are there any other instances of this mm -hmm. uh, where the kinds of dynamics that you've identified in China seem to be operating in ways that belong to authoritarianism? Or is it more or less an estimation that is really suited to China because it's 
Well, a lot of the specific reasons that I gave why the three theories wouldn't apply seem to be as a, as a package unique to China as far as I can see. But I do think the basic idea that an authoritarian regime that faces all kinds of challenges and that seems from a Western optic to be you know, out of touch with reality can survive for reasons of its own through effort to survive is an, one that applies in Iran, maybe in Kazakhstan, um, and um, Russia, you know, for example, and that the notion that there that there's a wave of democracy and that authoritarianism was an unfortunate episode in history that lasted for four thousand years but is finished. I don't think that's true, and I think political science needs to continue to study the dynamics of authoritarian regimes and how they operate because I think authoritarian regimes will continue to come into existence and continue to survive and adapt themselves to conditions of globalization in general. But the particular way that the Chinese regime has done it probably, let's take Iran, which is a country that I don't know, you know a lot about, but there they have a large middle class, they have a lot of dissent, they have a lot of free thinking individuals who don't believe in theocracy. They, and yet it would be, and I'm not, I don't want to make predictions about Iran that would just compound my being out on a limb, but I mean, they obviously at the moment are uh, keeping ahead of all of these challenges in their, uh, as a regime somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. How it how it will happen. Yeah. 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 Those are great, you know, questions. About the theory of this this doesn't um, I'm most perhaps most dismissive of the democratization theory because I don't see a pro democracy faction in the Chinese Communist Party, which Bruce sees. He talks, if you read the fine print of his book, he talks about Zheng Ching Hong, for example. And we talked with the guy who gave us the materials about Zheng Ching Hong and came away with, and this guy told us that, and we wrote in the book that Zheng Ching Hong is a very flexible character who would do whatever it took to you know, survive in power and to try to keep the regime afloat, including democratization. But I did not come away with the understanding that Zung saw a, you know, positive mission of democratizing, that he wanted to find an opening and then do that. I understood it to be, if he was forced to it, he would hop in that way. But that leads to the point that there, thanks to the repression by the Chinese Communist Party, there's no rival leadership in the country. There's no what Taiwan had at Dong Wai. Um, so I can't picture democratization. The weakness of the collapse theory to me is not, is that it's a very vague theory. To answer your question more directly, what would it take? The answer is it would take, as I said, a public health, uh, you know, perhaps epidemic that the regime would mishandle and couldn't keep under wraps that masses of people would think, 
I'm going to die and the government is doing nothing to help me, like people thought SARS was but turn out not to be because it wasn't that infectious actually. Or a war in the Taiwan Strait that China loses, which I think is not going to happen. I don't think that war is going to take place. Or a war in the Korean Peninsula that leads to, say, a flood of refugees, but which is another thing that I don't think is actually going to happen. So although I can envision contingencies leading to a collapse, these are con contingencies that I, I can think of are each quite unlikely. And then if you try to think of additional contingencies, they have the attribute of being even more unlikely. Say, you know, a meteorite falling or, you know, men from outer space landing in the Beijing Olympics or something like that. You know, it's, it, the, the ones that I thought about were the most likely ones, but at the present time they don't seem to be that likely. And the other thing about the collapse theory that, that I would... Um, <coughs> argue against it is that it isn't, it's not really, it doesn't really say what will happen. It uses the word collapse to purport to predict some outcome, but what is the outcome that is predicted by the word collapse? Um, what, what would that look like? From whom, though? I mean, so I'm, I'm a, I teach a Chinese foreign policy course, and I look around the environment of China, and, you know, they've got cooperative relationships with Russia, which in any case no longer has the military power to really threaten China. There's Japan. Relations with Japan are tense, but to think of it as of a situation where Japan would invade China Where's our Japan specialist? It's unimaginable to me. This would be really, really ill-advised. <laughs> the U.S. is obviously a concern for the Chinese, but again, it's not the trajectory of American strategy to, to, to you know, to, the fact is that our policy, although we have a hedge policy to encircle China, with military capabilities, and we are, uh, in the Chinese view, interfering in their sovereignty by insisting on a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue. The actual American strategy toward China as it's implemented in practice is the strategy of contributing to China's growth and rise through trade and investment. What about India or Iran? India, no, because they... Uh, the, uh, I mean, India, the, the absolute maximum, I think, that India could conceivably do would be to try to advance in the disputed border areas and perhaps give more support to the Dalai Lama for some disturbance, some challenge to China and Tibet. But it, it is physically inconceivable to me that either the Indian army could advance any significant degree into Chinese territory or that they could s support a movement in Tibet that would actually challenge Chinese control of Tibet, even if they made that the prime, which they won't, target of Indian foreign policy, which it isn't. I mean, Indian foreign policy, in fact, is going in the direction of slowly seeking accommodation with China. Iran, why would they? They don't even have a motive, I don't think, to challenge China. So China's foreign policy has been quite successful in creating this uh, environment of relative security. They, have, they always have a difficult foreign policy environment because they're dealing with so many countries and regional systems, the Northeast Asia regional system around North Korea, problem and everybody's interests there were Southeast Asia. But um, they're not uh, going to, and they could suffer, they could suffer certain foreign policy setbacks. That also seems unlikely, but their policy would, it would be a loss for Chinese policy if, say, the North Korean regime collapsed, and that could happen. Um, but it doesn't appear to be underway right now. That regime is another one that's not collapsing. Um, 
Yeah. The reason I think that Gilly and I perhaps came out with different perspectives might be This is a very interesting question, which I probably should have puzzled over a lot more than I did, but haven't had time to. But I think the intellectual autobiography that I gave you at the beginning might be part of the answer. I came from a position you know, that the system is going to collapse, and I was surprised by its resilience while Gilly came from a different background, which you can have him come talk about if you want to. But I won't go into it now. But And, and he was perhaps kind of surprised by something else, by the pragmatism of the leaders. Or, and he was uh, just entering grad school at the time. Uh, he had had a long career as a journalist and decided to go back to get a PhD at Princeton. So I think he was bedazzled by theories also. Okay. David Rosenberg. Thanks for that talk. Sure. Um, let's see. I think, uh, actually, there may be one other factor. Um, haven't, hasn't been mentioned much today. We might hear a lot more about it tomorrow uh, that may cause both uh, a threat of collapse and then perhaps a lurch towards democratization, hmm. and that is continued economic growth. And that, I think, uh, if you do the projections in a linear fashion, clearly leads to some finite limits in terms of water supply, energy supply, big demographic shifts, shifts in terms of urbanization, aging of the population. Somehow those complex problems have to be dealt with. And it wouldn't take too much in, of a, a tremor in the world economy to make all of those acutely difficult, leading to threats of collapse of transportation systems, the uh, uh, distribution uh, of supplies within the country, which could cause an imminent collapse. And one thing to head off an imminent collapse, especially of incomes in rural areas, might be democratization, mm -hmm. give more of a say. Why, in fact, you asked the rhetorical question, but why, in fact, do they make such an announcement that the state knows there are 80,000 protests or whatever form in the country? Isn't this also an early warning signal that we hear your protest? Mm -hmm. And the people who are protesting, I believe, are workers, farmers, uh, going through all these horror stories of uh, problems that I can tell from uh, as far as I can tell. So it seems we're really at the very beginning of the industrial revolution of China. And to figure out what it's going to be like 10 or 20 years hence is looking through this swirl of, of trends and activities. Right. It's hazardous to guess, but has there ever been a country anywhere that has gone through an industrial revolution successfully, without turning fascist, that didn't democratize? No, but uh, China is a very big country. And it's in a, another time in history from the one when those other countries went through this thing. And then it's another part of the world in another strategic environment and stuff like that. So, no, I agree. Those theories that I argued against are not spun out of thin air. They are the story of what happened before put into the form of theory. And I think what I'm arguing is two things. It ain't necessarily so going forward because history is always coming up with something new. And secondly, and more empirically, I'm saying the signs that are not there, which were supposed to be there already. I mean, according to Gordon Chang, China was going to collapse within 10 years from 2001. So that half period is half over. Gilly gives a time frame. McFarquhar in his Carnegie. So if you say to me that there's a swirl of things happening and in 25 years, and yeah, I mean, nobody knows what. And I, I try to. It, As a debater, I try to bring the thing back to the present. And I say, I don't know what's going to happen in 25 years, but I could tell you my analysis of the trajectories currently evolving on the ground now when they were already supposed to be happening, according to somebody else's theory. Now, could an economic downturn, I think you're, I agree with you very much that uh, trends in the world economy that would impact the Chinese economy would increase the number of dissatisfied people demonstrating and decrease the satisfaction ratio of all the people that right now are pretty happy with the regime. 
and create a sense that this was a regime that you know used to hack it, but now they can't hack it anymore. This is a good time to kick them in the butt. And that would be a very different chemistry, and that's the power deflation thing. I think the economy is a real fragile point for the regime, and yet many people said they couldn't do that, right? The economy was supposed to be overheated. It was supposed to be the banking system would collapse. It was supposed to be... Uh, the, you know, the workers would organize. It was supposed to be the water shortage and the environmental, you know, uncosted cost of environmental uh, degradation and all of those things, which may, which are still there and may happen. But the point is, there's now the 84,000 incidents. I've asked so many Chinese people, why did the Ministry of Public Security say that? Does that mean that they should all be fired if all those incidents are happening? And the only answer I've gotten from my Chinese friends is part of the budget battle in Beijing to put this number out there and say we need more budget. I'm not entirely satisfied with that answer, but I simply don't know what the answer is to that very valid question, why they did it. All right. Uh John Brain. These kinds of conditions in which there are more men than women, particularly more young men than young women, uh, is it creates instability. And I was wondering if you thought that this kind of a demographic shift would uh, affect China's politics. Yeah, and there's the other one about the dependency ratio that increases due to the uh, one child. Uh, now, I forget the numbers, but people have worked it out that in such and such a year, there'll be so many old people for those that are re working, it'll be like GM or something. Yeah, these are babies already born. You can predict how many people are going to be in the yeah. labor force and how many so, out of the labor force. And it's going to be yeah. worse. Then there is, there's, there's the water shortage. There are many problems that are there now that are, you know, can be confirmed, like, you know, that the babies are born now, the male to female ratio is there now. So the answer to that, well, one thing is I just don't know how that kind of thing works itself through politics, what would happen. I, I lack the imagination to envision that causal linkage. But as a generality, my answer to that is that the leaders need the capability to find policy answers to muddle through all these problems. And I, I'm not the guy with all these policy answers, but I see a government machine that has experts, has data, has access to international policy wonks around the world, has made decisions in the past. So I, I think we cannot rule out, if I can put, put it in that kind of double negative to advantage myself as a debater, I, we cannot rule out the government coming up with mechanism, you know, with policies that will allow it to weather these predictable challenges. Okay, John, go ahead. Perception of a military threat 
that is growing in our leadership because China is doing well economically and is spending more money yeah. on military power. <clears throat> This is a very big debate in Washington, which is somewhat tied up with the debate that we've been talking about today. I co-authored a book called The Great Wall and the Empty Fortress, China's Search for Security that was published in 1997, in which we argued against the China threat theory. And a different co-author and myself are now working on a second edition of that book that we aim to publish in 2008, where we will again, not agree with the China threat theory. Now, the rise of the Chinese military is a fact, and they're accumulating additional capabilities. But right now, those capabilities are chiefly directed at a Taiwan scenario, the potential use of force in the Taiwan Strait. They have other security concerns, the uh, security of the sea lanes of communication in the South China Sea. They have to be prepared against the rise of you know, the Japanese military is also improving itself step by step. The U.S. is promoting theater missile defense, both in the Japan theater and the Taiwan theater. The U.S. is present in Central Asia. The Chinese use uh, diplomacy and, and also build up their military to be prepared for various contingencies. The Defense Department then looks at that build up. It's kind of a classic security dilemma dynamic and says what in their the annual DOD report on the Chinese uh, military they raised the question after Taiwan what so assuming you know and this is correct for the DOD to think down the road that after Taiwan somehow is uh, resolved one way or the other and China has all these capabilities what will it do next there aren't too many answers to that because I don't think that most, I don't, I don't believe, and I don't think that most American military thinkers believe that China will challenge a U.S. naval supremacy in the South China Sea. It's just too expensive, and it's, it's not the strategy that they've taken. Um, I don't think that China obviously has not developed force projection capability to be present in the Middle East or Africa or South America. Their energy policy in those areas is based upon a diplomatic strategy. I just don't see the, the place where, now you can dream up things, Korea and Taiwan, where the two armies would come to a clash. and where that would be a very serious clash. And a lot of the debate in Washington is over Chinese so-called asymmetric warfare and how they might defeat us in a Taiwan scenario, even though our military is better than theirs, uh, and so forth. And those things are worrisome. In the case of a Taiwan Strait scenario, the Chinese military has a real capability to inflict damage on the US. And in a combination of military and political events, we could lose. Um, so, but beyond Taiwan, I just don't see it. I can't see where it would happen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've received an instruction that uh, we're going to call uh, this evening's discussion to a close. Mm. So, uh, before we, we thank uh, Andy, uh, um, I, I would just uh, like to tell the people who didn't have a chance to answer, ask their questions that he'll be here for a few minutes afterwards and he'd be happy to, to speak to you for a few minutes. Um, so Andy, thanks so much for your remarks today. Thank you.